So, Mark, hi. Um, we're here in Birmingham, and we're the guests of Ratcliffe Cardiology, um, and we're just discussing some of the current topics in arrhythmias that I think are of interest to people who are attending this meeting. Um, just considering the questions that we're dealing with in the management and, I guess, the ablation of atrial fibrillation at the moment, it's certainly an area that's changing. Um, do you think we were at a particular turning point, moving from empiricism to more mechanistic-based therapy? I guess some people think we are. Um, th thanks, Andrew. Uh, nice to see you here in Birmingham. Uh, it's, uh, it's clearly an area of focus uh, in both this meeting, but also obviously the, the big international meetings over the last 12 months. Uh, probably the main focus in the atrial fibrillation arena has been this particular question of how do we tackle persistent atrial fibrillation in a way that we think we have probably come to understand paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in most patients, we believe we understand uh, at least a putative mechanism, so we have a therapeutic target and we have a therapy that can execute that target, pulmonary vein isolation. For persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, no single strategy has been proven uh, to be applicable across multiple centres in the same way that pulmonary vein isolation has done. And so over the last two to three years, we have definitely seen a turn away from a largely indiscriminate ablation in the atrium or ablation guided by non-specific markers of disturbed electrical function to more mechanistic or mechanism-driven ablation of atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation. And obviously the two big players in this field at the moment uh, are the two technologies uh, mapping what are termed rotors in, in the left and right atrium. Uh, those technologies are very different and in fact what the technologies have found uh, is a little different um, but the premise is the same for both that in an individual patient with atrial fibrillation there is a perpetuating mechanism if they have persistent atrial fibrillation and that that perpetuating mechanism can be identified and treated. So whether it's by basket mapping using the Tapira system from the endocardial surface of the heart, or whether it's body surface uh, mapping from the epicardial surface of the heart, in other words, from the outside of the body. Both do seem to demonstrate the presence uh, of uh, localized mechanisms of uh, organized activation, which when targeted appear to improve clinical outcome. Obviously, uh, these data are exciting, new, um, and very disruptive because it's changed completely the way that we think about how we manage persistent atrial fibrillation. There are a few caveats. One is that uh, these technologies are not widely available, so they haven't been widely assessed in the hands of uh, you know, large numbers of electrophysiologists who will need to be using these to manage patients with uh, persistent um, atrial fibrillation. We don't have any long-term data with these technologies. We had a a lot of enthusiasm about our ablation technologies for paroxysmal AF early on, only to find out that uh, five years down the road, the uh, outcomes were not probably quite as good as we were expecting. And I think with persistent atrial fibrillation, the early outcomes with these mechanism-driven therapies do appear to be good in selected hands, but we don't know what the longer-term benefit is uh, in these patients. Just in regard to the discrimination at the clinical level from the point of view of the interventional ph electrophysiologist between paroxysmal and persistent, um, do you really think that if we get robust pulmonary vein isolation, we're truly getting the best results we can? Do you think there'll be an overlap between the approaches, if you like? And I think that's what certainly come out of Dr. Narian's work in regard to even right atrial origins as some subsets of paroxysm. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, that's a great question. I think that maybe one day we will look at uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and persistent atrial fibrillation, that description as uh, really a very ineffective way to describe this arrhythmia. Atrial fibrillation can be due to a single site rapidly firing focus or atrial fibrillation can be a diffuse disease of both atria. They're both called atrial fibrillation, but they're not both the same thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that there certainly will be overlap and what we need is much better characterization of the arrhythmia mechanism in individual patient. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and we've all seen them where they have a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, they come back symptomatic, they have maybe one reconnection on one vein. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very difficult for me to believe that in every single patient with paroxysmal AF after a pulmonary vein isolation procedure that 
every recurrence is simply due to reconnection of a pulmonary vein. It can't be that all paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is all pulmonary vein dependent. Mm -hmm. So these sorts of technologies sure have the ability, along with other technologies, to allow us to better phenotype atrial fibrillation in the future. So rather than calling it paroxysmal or persistent, mm -hmm. we actually give a, a mechanism in the, way that usually, in the way that previously for SVT, we would say, well, you know, that's a lot of different diagnoses. SVT is a lot of different things. But if we say it's AV or to utilizing a post-receptor accessory pathway, that's very specific, mm -hmm. and we know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I think in atrial fibrillation, we'll be going down the same route where we're using very specific uh, descriptors mm -hmm. uh, to explain the mechanism in an individual patient. My vision of like five years on, just as a, a thing I'm playing with, is the idea you'll go in, isolate the veins, maybe try and induce AF then in the paroxysmal case, if you can induce it uh, in the subset, like Maradi did in the mid-2000s, you will then pursue that through a, a, a novel, possibly more expensive mapping technology in a subset of patients and target that. And this will up the success rates. Do you think that's a reasonable proposition? Yeah, I think something like that is reasonable. I mean, I, I, I have a... Uh, probably a, a slightly, not different, maybe complementary view, <coughs> which is that I foresee a day when we probably won't offer atrial fibrillation ablation mm -hmm. to patients in whom we currently offer it because we can predict in advance of the ablation that the long-term outcome is not going to be good. Uh, so I foresee a day where we do exactly that, a pulmonary vein isolation mm -hmm. procedure for somebody with what we understand to be paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, followed by an, some electrophysiological assessment of mm -hmm. the atrium. And that needs to be much more sophisticated than a voltage map or mm. an activation map in sinus rhythm, but an integrated map of uh, structural assessment of the atrium, and then perhaps a dynamic electrical map of the atrium, uh, and maybe even using some computer modeling mm. to assess whether or not that atrium, after pulmonary vein isolation, could be capable of sustaining atrial fibrillation again in the future. So this is personalized medicine. Yes. I think personalized medicine for the future, and again, another view that I'm pushing is the idea that electrophysiology being a highly quantifiable trait, you know, through, for example, and the example I often use is, say, the PR interval, you know, which is highly measurable and you can do it hundreds of thousands of people mapped onto genomics. So I guess the question could be, is do you think, as well as a phenotypic approach to stratification, could you imagine in the future a genetic approach? <coughs> Well, I can't think that far in the future, probably, but uh, it's a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. I think uh, at the moment, there's a lot of interest in the genetic space about what the influencing features are for a patient mm -hmm. getting atrial fibrillation, but I can't see, probably because of my lack of long-term vision, mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, how a genetic approach can be applied in mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation. I'd be interested to hear what, you know, what, what, what your sort of view I mean, on that so, is. So my vision is that you, could, you will be able to increase the capabilities of current genomic stratification, uh, st genomic categorization, if you like, to extract more information through better phenotyping. So, for example, you know, pulmonary veins, if we say that patient, uh, that you, you, you enrich your population um, with pulmonary vein driven atrial fibrillation through phenotypic assays that are invasive, then you'll be able to get better genetics from that, and then you'll be able to define your genetic population up front and say these are PV, or you'll be able to say these are right atrial, etc. So I think there is a way forward that you can move forward to 2020, 2025 and onwards, um, that you'll be able to do some sort of other test that is not necessarily based on the phenotype in respect of individual patients. But again, this is obviously looking way into the future. Yeah, and it's it is not way into the future. not practical for the moment at all. But it's, it, I think it's the direction of travel. And I, mm. I, I, I often uh, answer this type of question by saying, well, look back 20 years. We're in 2014 now. Mm. So if we look back to 1994, yeah. no, nobody had ever done an AF ablation mm. in 1994. Mm. The first attempt, I think, was yeah. round about that time yeah. with uh, Schwartz on patients in an ITU setting where everybody thought this is a crazy idea yeah. to do this. 20 years later, this is uh, now uh, a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. Yes. Mul many, many millions of patients benefited from these yes. technologies. So, you know, who knows where we'll be in 20 years, yes. but uh, it'll probably be far beyond what I can imagine it will be in 20 yeah. years. So I think that what you're saying is yeah. not at all unrealistic. And I think, you know, again, I th I, my view is the fact that I been in, in this thing for 20 plus years myself now, you know, that I think 20 years forward will be much better at the substratification of these patients, the target therapy, and therefore getting better results for our patients. And I'm sure no, you'll I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's very true. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.